Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege and the honor to praise your name, to, to lift your name on high, to tell you how much we love you, how much we need you, knowing that as children we we're reaching out for you and you're reaching your hand back down to us. And you're holding your, our hand and you're leading us and guiding us. And we submit and we surrender our lives to you. We thank you for setting us apart. I ask that you cause every hearer of the word to have good soil, like Scott prayed ahead of time, that each person has good soil to receive the word of God today. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, because you know I can't do anything without you, please let me be your vessel, your conduit. Just speak through me and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, most of chapter 3, <clears throat> about the leaders in the church. But it really pertains to all of us, you know, if we really want to walk in integrity to, towards the Lord. And um, so it's not going to be as boring as you think it will. <laughs> it's, it's about <clears throat> overseers and deacons. You know, I don't want to skip the word. You know, I want to keep plowing through. So it's, uh, I, named, I entitled it Leaders in the Church, and I will jump right in because it's like a heated pool. It's really easy to jump into. It's very comfortable. <laughs> First Timothy 3, I'm just saying that because we were at Lori's, Laura's house this Monday, and her pool was heated, and it was brackish water. I never heard of that, salt well, you said it was partially salt water, so that's brackish. That's like, okay, but anyway, it was so good. <clears throat> you just like you could just you don't even you're not like going ah you're just like walking right into it. You're like oh this is great. <laughs> so let's just walk right into the word. So First Timothy three verses one through seven in the Passion translation. If any of you, and the Greek word for that word is not gender specific. Okay, so if any of you aspires to be an overseer, which is generally referring to a pastoral position of some sort, so if any of you aspire to be an overseer in the church, you have, to set, you have set your heart toward a noble ambition, for the word is true. Yet an elder, see that's part of the overseer, yet an elder needs to be one without, who is without blame. That's going to be a biggie, so I'm going to save that for later, okay? But um, who is to be without blame before others? Because that sounds like, oh my gosh, well, who, who of us are without blame? We'll get into that later. Um, he should be one whose heart is for his wife alone and not another woman. So that's basically a one-woman man. Or, if you're a female, a one-man woman, <laughs> Yeah, right? I was going to say that wrong. He should be recognized as one who is sensible, which is sober-minded, and well-behaved, which is self-controlled, keeping your head in all situations, and living a disciplined life, which is respectable, orderly, and modest. He should be a spiritual shepherd who has the gift of teaching, for to teach and preach is the primary task of elders, and to be a continual student of the word. These are my little notes I'm in, dabbling in there. And is known for his hospitality, which is not what you think. It's really loving a stranger. And, and that's really good. We should all be continual students for the rest of our lives. We should never think we've arrived. I love to learn. I will be a student till the day I leave this no, actually, I'm going to be a student even after I leave this earth suit because I cannot wait to take Paul's classes in heaven <laughs> and all the different classes in heaven. Um, he cannot be a drunkard or someone who lashes out at others, and that's not being violent, but a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper. Peacekeepers are people that become doormats to try to keep the peace with toxic people. No, a peacemaker is totally different. So he's not someone who lashes out at others, who's not violent, not argumentative, not quarrelsome, Some, or cannot be someone who simply craves more money, lovers of money, right? The love of money is the root of all evil. But it instead is recognized by his gentleness. Gentleness. So the, the Greek word 
for gentle is e equitable. And it was funny because I, I'm reading these words and they're so hard that I was like putting in parentheses kind of what the other meaning is. So to be gentle is to be equitable, which is impartial. Reasonable, we know what that means. Forbearing, which is patient. Moderate, which is restrained. Fair and considerate. To be gentle is the opposite of being harsh, abrasive, sarcastic, cruel, and contentious. So if you know somebody who's all those things, they are not gentle. <laughs> okay? But, we, but these leaders, and we'll see that it all can pertain to all of us, should be all of these good things and not all of these yucky things that have been mentioned. Verse 4, his heart should be set on guiding his household with wisdom and dignity, bringing up his children to worship with devotion and purity. For children's church starts at home, you know? We can't just d depend on the church giving the, the, the babies a word once a week. We got to, you know, intertwine it into their lives. You know, raise up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from it. So don't worry if it seems like they're departing from it. Have, keep the faith. Speak over your situation. Okay, so. If he's, um, verse 5, if he's unable to properly lead his own household well, how could he properly lead God's household? He should not be a new disciple who would be vulnerable to living in the clouds of conceit and fall into pride, making him easy prey for Satan. That's very important because sometimes, you know, in the ministry, when you really are <sighs> desperate for certain positions to be filled, you might fill them with people that are immature, but they have the gifting of like, you know, playing an instrument or doing something. And you have to be careful because sometimes, well, especially in the speaking gifts, right? People get that, people love the mic. Some people love the mic and it's like scary. So. If you're giving the mic to an immature believer, then they start getting puffed up. I mean, Pastor Rick of um, in Lindenhurst of Evangel Church of God, I'll never forget it. He, re he was talking about when he was a young minister, and he was so good, right? He was like, but he didn't realize that he was flowing in the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, one day, he came up behind that podium, and he was so full of himself, and the Lord let his words fall to the ground. He just fell flat on his face that day. And he felt so awful and he realized, I am nothing and can do nothing without the Lord. And so he learned a, a lesson. But so when you have a new disciple, you have to help them to grow and mature in the Lord and to realize that without the Lord, you can do nothing. You can, do, you can go up to a certain point, but don't even think you're going to do the work of the Lord and be anointed if you're not fully depending on him. So when it says not a new believer or not a new disciple, it says, uh, you know, the word means one who's newly planted. See, they're a seedling. They're a little baby plant. You got to let them grow big. They're, um, or one who's newly come to the faith. Immaturity can include a vulnerabil vulnerability. Oh, that was weird. I couldn't say that. Vulnerability. Woo! Say that 10 times fast. To pride. They're vulnerable to pride. <laughs> I might have to take a speech therapy class on the, just that word alone. And that could cause serious stumbling. So only one who is mature in the faith should be entrusted with the responsibility of leadership in the church. Okay, because Proverbs 16, 18 says, and we'll go back to the last verse of what I was going to read, but Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride be co goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. So that says it all right there. And the word also says the Lord resists the proud. And the word resist doesn't just mean he resists you. It means like he pushes you away. I don't want to be pushed away from the Lord. So going back, though, to verse 7, he should be respected by those who are unbelievers, having a beautiful testimony among them so that they will not fall into the traps of Satan and be disgraced. Now, you might think, wait a minute, oh, gosh, what about, like, people that are unbelievers and know my past, you know? Well, we're going to get to that with the without blame part. But this is really meaning, like, um, does he have a good reputation among unsaved people whom he does business with? 
Does he manifest a wholesome character? Is there evidence of his new birth to unbelievers? Or is he making the Lord look bad with his behavior? So that's what I believe that is pertaining to. So, you know, like we could be a good uh, representation of Jesus or we could not even have enough evidence to convict us of Christianity. And so people might not even know we're saved or we're behaving so badly that we're giving Jesus a bad name. So we cannot do that, especially as leaders in the church. There was uh, a person who had a business um, that um, he was one way with his business. And he, he had a church for a time. And he, from what I was told, his employees like couldn't stand him. And then he was trying to get his employees to come to his church. And they were like, we're not going to your church. You know, because you're, you know, so you act one way when you're a pastor and then you treat us a certain way. And, uh, you know, this was a story told to me by my, my be beloved in heaven. So, you know, you don't want to be that way because now he was being a bad witness to his employees. Like, you can't compartmentalize your life that way. I know men have a tendency to compartmentalize, but... No, in your Christian walk, you got to be like uh, steady and the same, and uh, I'm losing the word, but consistent. You can't, you got to treat everybody with respect and love. Like, first of all, we're all human beings and we deserve respect. That's why I, I say there's a difference between a boss and a leader. And I've had bosses that were very disrespectful just because they were my boss. And I'm thinking, first of all, you know, hello everyone's a fellow human being there's ways to speak to people and yes sometimes you have to you know speak with a stern voice and and but you know but then there's people that go into the to the verbally abusive toxic arena and I've had that like just insulting me because I wore glasses and I'm like how is that being a, a, a boss you know but so you have to be consistent in your behavior towards all others now that's why I'm saying all this behavior is especially for leaders in the church, but as, but for all of us, it pertains to all of us. This is speaking to all of us, and we'll we'll also exp I'll also explain to you why later. So now we're jumping into First Timothy three, eight through thirteen in the Passion. And in the same way, deacons, servant leaders, must be those who are pure and true to their word. Now, what is a deacon, though? Before I even continue, well. <clears throat> the origin of deacons was servant leaders, and that was most likely started in Acts chapter 6 when seven were chosen to um, serve in practical ways to alleviate the apostles and allow them to have more time to study the word. Stephen, or Stephen, 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 was one of the seven. So that's where deacons comes from. And it's, you know, like I'm telling you, the least of these is the greatest in the kingdom of God. So if you are cleaning toilets unto the Lord, guess what? You'll probably be sitting next to Jesus, and I'll be in the, um, in the overflow room. So don't think that just because, you know, you, what we perceive as positions in the church are so great, because it could be that one person that dedicates their life to cleaning the church unto the Lord, and that that's their worship, that they are in a greater position in heaven than me. You know, because I don't think who I am, but, you know, people, who's the pastor? Okay, so I just want you to know that's where the word deacon comes from. So it says, in the same way the deacons, servant leaders, and it's an honor to serve. Like Alice and the ladies that serve in the back, and Steve who does the, you know, like everyone who serves is so important in the, in the body of Christ. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He humbled himself to show the, the, the least is the greatest, you know, serve. Have a heart of a servant. And that's what I pray. I pray that the Lord send people with the heart of a servant so that we can all just serve together in the kingdom of God. Back on track. So they must be those who are pure and true to their word. So they got to be a person of their word, a person that you can trust what they say, that they will do what they say and say what, they, what they'll do, you know. Not be addicted to wine. Not, be, not with greedy eyes on the contributions. Okay, you know, God forbid, Steve had greedy eyes on the contributions. <laughs> but no, that man's a man of integrity. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> 
Instead, they must fully embrace the mysteries of the faith. Fully embrace the mysteries of the faith while keeping a clean conscience. So that means being in the word every day with the Holy Spirit. And there's no better way to be in the word every day with the Holy Spirit. Because while you're reading the word, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's downloading things to you. And you're, I mean, I've always found myself having conversations with the Holy Spirit while I'm reading the word. And he's showing me things. I'm like, aha. You know, it's so good. But <clears throat> going, going into that faithfully. Faithfully embracing the mysteries of faith. A deacon who does not know the Bible is an obstacle to growth in a local assembly. Simply, a successful businessman or a generous contributor or, uh, doesn't necessarily mean he or she is qualified to serve as a deacon or a servant leader. You must be in the word to serve. Okay, turning the page. They must, okay, so where am I? Um, verse 10, and each of them must be found trustworthy. So I have in my notes, an untested Christian is an unprepared Christian. A pilot doesn't really know his own qualifications until after his real first forced landing. So preparation, they must be found trustworthy according to these standards before they are given responsibility to minister as servant leaders without blame. And believe me, we're getting to without blame later. Okay, <clears throat> and the women, wives, women and wives, also who serve in the church should be dignified, meaning reverent. Carry yourself. Carry yourself well. Uh, dignified, number 4586, that's a Greek word. Behavior that is honorable, decent, worthy of respect. Leaders in a church should set a good example, displaying um, <clears throat> a manner of acting that commands respect. This ideal, idealistic attractiveness should be tra ca characterized by all Christians and Christian couples. We don't want to see a bickering couple, do we? That's not being very dignified. So, um, but women wives who serve in the church should be dignified, reverent, faithful in all things, having their thoughts set on truth. So again, setting our thoughts on the truth, which is the word of God and not known as those who gossip. Because gossip is slander, and it says, the word slanderer comes from the Greek word diabolos. Diablo? Yeah, the devil. So that was one of the Satan's titles. He was the slanderer, diablo, or diabolos in Greek. So <clears throat> we don't want to be known as those who gossip. Number 12, verse 12, a deacon's heart must be toward his wife alone. Again, one woman man, one man woman. Leading his children and household with excellence. Now let's say there's a deacon couple, right? Because this deacon couples that are being servant leaders, they should be working hand in hand. And like we, I discussed in past weeks, He's, his God-given role is leadership, and they are to submit one to another, to be under one's mission. She's to um, be devoted to him, and he is to love her as his own body and as Christ loved the church and died for her. So as they are walking in love and respect, it's going to be a better household because they are backing each other up. So when the kids think they're going to come out of their face, as my mother would say, they have to have each other's back. They're under each other's mission. You know, I don't know. That was a side note. All right, so, so they are going to lead their children and household with excellence. For those who serve, verse 13, in this way will obtain an honorable reputation, a good ranking militarily for themselves, and a greater right to speak boldly in the faith that comes from the anointing of Jesus. So as they serve faithfully as a servant leader, it's as though Jesus gives them a promotion. And just to give you a tid, uh, kind of a little key, it's those who don't want the promotion that are the best qualified for it. Because it's the ones that are really thirsty for that promotion are the ones that could be sometimes falling into pride because they're so focused on that promotion because they want to use it as a position of esteem. 
it's usually the ones that don't want it. Like, I didn't want this. I was even telling the Lord yesterday, you know, I loved being his wife. I loved hiding behind him. I loved serving with him. I loved being his backup. I loved assisting him in whatever he needed. I did not need to be here. He even was always on my case. Jess, you got to speak more. Jess, you got to share more. And I'm like, okay. And I would cheat and do my five-minute openers, you know, because I was like, okay, see, I shared. So, you know, I, this is not what I wanted. And, and, and when Kevin Zadai was in heaven, he told Jesus, but I don't want to do this. And he, he goes, I can't do this. I don't want to do it. And he goes, you're perfect for the job. You know, and so, <clears throat> and I guess it's, it's, it's a matter of the opposite of pride, humility. And just saying, I can't do this, though. And, and he's like, yeah, you're perfect for the job because you know you can't. You know you can't do this, so you're going to lean, trust, rely, and cling to me and allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you, and he'll do the work. Hallelujah. Cha-cha-cha. Okay, moving on to Matthew 25, 21 in the New King James Version. Hmm. This is talking about being found trustworthy. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, so as you're faithful with even the little bit that you might have here on earth unto the Lord, he's going to see that you're faithful, and then he's going to give you more. I know that's speaking about heaven, but I also believe that pertains here on the earth because everything is dual and multifaceted. And so as you prove in your humility that, Lord, I will do whatever you want. And that's what I used to tell the Lord <laughs> when I married Pastor Rob. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm a pastor's wife. Like, I, I, it, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me until after I married him. And I was like, okay, all right, okay, okay, okay. Okay, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do, even if I hate it. And that's what I told him. I said straight out, even if I don't like it, I don't care whatever it is you need me to do, I will do because I love you. And, you know, and that's the way you're supposed to be. And I heard, and this is a very good test, and you might get tested one day. <laughs> but they say that if, if people are, are after position in the church, you give them something that you know they would absolutely hate to do and see how they would, hmm. No, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Oh, okay, wrong person for the job. Because, you know, you have to, and um, I, I believe at uh, Pastor Rob's wake, someone was mentioning that, where they wanted position in the church, and he was like, all right, and he brought him into the bathroom and said, okay, clean it. <laughs> clean the, the bathroom. And they're like, ah, uh, yeah. So, you know, be willing to do whatever it takes for the Lord. Just do it unto him. Just say, you, you know what, you're my dad, I'm your child, you're the judge, you are the king of angel armies, you are the military leader, you are everything, and whatever you need me to do, what are my marching orders, Lord? What are my marching orders? I'll do them, whatever it takes. Say, Jessica, all right, I want you to go over there and mop the hallway floor. Okay, Lord. You know, and it might just be that I just simply see it's filthy. You know, and we got to take ownership. If we see something on the floor, you pick it up. That's ownership. But when you walk by it and you're like, that's not ownership. That's like, I don't care. You know? And, I'm, and it's not even pertaining to God's house. You know? Okay. Let's talk about being without blame. Okay. Okay. So um, who here has a past? Okay. All right. Another question. Should we let our past define us? Right? No. Is not our past under the blood of Christ? Yeah. Hasn't it been erased then? Like Tom was saying, the word atonement meant to cover. Propitiation means to wipe out, wipe clean, erase. It doesn't even exist anymore. He's the great eraser. Like, if you bring it up to him, he's going to go, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, my blood washed it away. It's an, I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, okay, another one. Do we still all mess up? Why? Why do we mess up? Because we're works in progress? Whips. We're whips. Works in progress. And like Wade Taylor, who was 
Pastor Rob's, um, his Bible school mentor, always pointed out in many of his writings, it all comes down to the intentions of our heart unto the Lord. The Lord truly knows our hearts. And if our heart truly wants to please him, and we are seeking him and his right way of doing it, that's when it says, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It means seeking the Lord and his right way of doing things. Then as we are reaching out to him, the Father is reaching out down to us and he's pouring his grace on us to do whatever it is that he has called each of us to do. And that's the way we're, we're to live our lives. None of us is perfect. I'm not perfect. Are you? Please, if you're perfect, let me know so I can emulate your life. Because the only perfect person I know to emulate his life is Jesus. He's so perfect. So if you would like to serve the Lord, which I hope that all of you would love to serve the Lord in some capacity, realize that your sins are erased and you can press forward in him. What did Jesus say to those um, who wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery? Let's see, John 8, 7 in the Amplified Classic. However, when they persisted with their question, he raised himself up and said, let who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And he knew he could say that because nobody except him could have stoned her. And what did he say to her? He said, go and sin no more. Meaning the intention of your heart is to please him with your life. We're works in progress. We are in these earth suits. We will mess up, but our intention is to love him and, 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 and worship him with our lives. Go and sin no more. Will we have stone throwers? Absolutely. We will all always have stone throwers. There are many people out there with the made-up, fictitious 10th gift of the Spirit. Do you know what that is? It's, a, it's, it's, called the, it's, it's not real, but it's called the gift of criticism. <clears throat> Satan will always find people who are willing vessels to be used by him to try to keep us in condemnation. But guess what? They are not without sin. So what are we to do? Philippians 3, 13 through 15 will tell us what we are to do. And this is Paul speaking. <clears throat> Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, which means arrived. None of us have arrived. But one thing I do, forgetting those which are behind, I reach forward with maximum extension to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us say as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, like if, you don't, if you're not mature and you don't have this in mind, don't worry, God will reveal even this to you. It's an upward call. And like I said before, like with the treadmill, you have to keep walking on that treadmill. Because the minute you, you stop, you backslide. So you have to keep moving forward because when you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. So we are pressing toward the goal. We are reaching forward, and I love that because it meant, and Pastor Rob taught us, all the students of Pastor Rob knows, whenever he, re we, he read that scripture, it means to reach forward with maximum extension. You are reaching, you know? It's so good. To that, we're pressing toward the goal for that prize, for the upward call, and that's what we're supposed to do. Ignore them. They are being used by the devil. And then we've got this one, which I really love. Proverbs 24, 16, New King James Version. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So we're whips, right? We're works in progress. It's showing that we're going to fall, but we shall rise. Paul is one of, let's look at Paul, right? Because we know Paul, he's, the, he's, he's a goat. He's the greatest of all time. Paul is one of the greatest apostles that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament with revelation that could only come from Jesus himself when he was caught up. Because in the silent years, Paul went into the heavenly realms 
Jesus, he would say, you know, the Lord, you know, he, he spoke in the third person, but the Lord caught him up a couple of times and gave him intense revelation that even the other apostles were like, wow, read Paul. Paul was the man, okay? And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And the revelation was amazing. We, are, we should all be so thankful for Paul because he was obedient to God and he gave us so much revelation to live by. So, but before Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. He had a past. He killed and he persecuted Christians. And then later on, he goes on to say that he has wronged no one. How could he say that? How could he say that? Well, in 2 Corinthians 7, 2, it says, Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. How could he say that? Paul was a zealous Pharisee who killed Christians. He approved of Stephen's, Stephen, 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 potato, potato, Stephen's death. He held the outer garments of the stone throwers that killed this spirit-filled man of God that did many uncommon miracles as a deacon, as a servant leader. He was spirit-filled the way the Lord wants us all to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul was responsible for his death, a man that followed the upward call and had such a communion with Jesus Christ that miracles were flowing out of him like living water. You know, they didn't expect that. They expected all that from the apostles. And here's the guy who's serving tables. He's feeding the widows and handing out food. He's in the food pantry. He was doing nothing that gives you accolades, but yet that man had such a relationship with Jesus Christ that miracles, he was, he was um, performing uncommon miracles, and he wouldn't shut up. He was really getting the Pharisees upset. I mean, they were tearing their hair out. That's why they killed him, because they, they couldn't handle the truth. So they killed him, and that's what happens in this earth realm. When they can't handle the truth, they kill you. So let's see. We should be imitators of Stephen. And not only Stephen, but so many others were killed and persecuted by Paul. And yet Paul became the goat, right? He became the greatest of all time. And he says in other scripture, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he could say that with confidence because he's a new creation. So he had the audacity to say that he wronged no man because he was a new creation in Christ. He was speaking out of being that new creation. He was not Saul anymore. Saul was knocked off his high horse, right? If you read about Saul, that old man did not exist anymore. And I'm sure he struggled with memories and guilt from the past blood that was shed by him on his hands, right? And the enemy, I'm sure, tried to remind him and condemn him for his past as others would try to do to us, not realizing that they're just being used by Satan. Because Satan never wants you to remember you're a new creation. And even as a new creation, like I said, a righteous man may fall seven times, but we rise again. We're works in progress. We just keep moving. We keep moving. We do not let Satan keep us in condemnation. Okay. So because of Jesus, Paul had a revelation that he was, he had the revelation. It wasn't even like he just read it. I'm a new creation in Christ. And, that, and you don't get it. Like he knew that he knew that he knew in his knower, I am a new creation. Saul is dead. I'm Paul now. Oh, and to know, to know what Jesus revealed to him, to know some of it was disclosed in what he wrote. But I'm sure the rest of everything that Paul ever received from Jesus is just too great for the volume of the book. You know how it says, if they were to record everything that Jesus did while he was here, it would just fill... All the books of the world, they just be too many books. So we get to learn all that in heaven. All right, so then may we all get this actual revelation in our heart that we are new creations and we are no longer condemned. Hallelujah. Romans 8.1 in the New American Standard Version of Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is conviction from the Holy Spirit but no condemnation. And we've learned that conviction just means convincing. The Holy Spirit convinces us. He says, come on, Jess, you just messed up. You know better. Or if you didn't know better, 
Jess, that was nice. And then you're like, okay, Holy Spirit, come on. And then he'll be like, come on. Let's move forward in Jesus. That's conviction. Condemnation, we all know what that is. I don't even have to tell you what condemnation is because the devil has tried it on all of us, you know, calling us turds and stuff and that we're worthless. No, none of that. We are daughters and kings. We are daughter, sons and daughters of the king. We are royalty, princes and princesses. And our dad is like, you know, God of the angel armies, man. And we've got angels in this place. And they're ministering to you and for you. Hallelujah. So let's talk about King David. Acts 13, 22, New King James Version. says, And when he had removed King Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. He removed King Saul put David in as king, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Now, if you've read anything about King David, then you know that he was at, at, at one time, while he was king, an adulterer and a murderer. So how could, he, how could the Lord say, oh, David's a man after my own heart? Well, the answer definitely was in that verse, who will do all my will, who will do all my will. So he knew that there was something in David that would always do all the will of God when never asked, you know? Okay. David did whatever God wanted him to do. Another question could be, how could God still call David a man after his own heart when David committed such com terrible sins? Do you want the abbreviated version? Okay. He saw a girl on the roof taking a bath. She was beautiful. He wanted her. She was married. He had her. Got her pregnant. Oh, man. Husband came back. He's like, go. Be with your wife. No, I will not. And he slept outside at the door because he felt, how can I go be with my wife when my men are on the battlefield dying and suffering and fighting? And David's like, oh, damn. So then David said, okay. He went to another leader in the military and said, okay, put him at the front, front lines. Now, you know the front lines was a death sentence. So he did that on purpose. So he can get rid of him and have her. And, uh, and their first child died. But then they had Solomon. So you see how there's always redemption. Like he cried and he prayed and he wanted that baby to be saved. But then once the baby went to heaven and he knew where the baby was, he dusted himself off and he was like, okay. You know, and um, there were certain things, other things he did that he was pointed out to him. But the moment he ever was pointed out something, he, he was first to, 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 to repent. So because we could all be blindsided. We could all have tunnel vision. We could all have um, blind, um, husband used to say it, blind spots. I don't know, whatever. We can be blind to certain things. And we need other people to point them out. And it's true, all of us, all of us. So he probably had some blind spots, and, um, but whenever his blind spots were shown to him, he, he responded and repented. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the stories. Read the Bible. So them. <laughs> so let's see. That was, yeah, I didn't even mean to do that, but I wasn't going to spoil the, you that much. But I figure most of you have read David. So how could God still call him that after he did those things? Well, we learn from much of David's character in the book of Psalms, because David put him, his whole self out there as he opened his life. He opened his life up to be examined by the way he wrote the Psalms. He was always crying out to God. The Psalms are beautiful prayers. You know, it's, 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 it's definitely, like Tom said, that <clears throat> he encouraged himself. And when he was encouraging himself, he was... It was like in the spirit of prophecy, he was encouraging himself and saying, I'm not a worm. <laughs> you know, basically, I'm a new creation in Christ. Or, and, but I love the prayers. You can pray so many of the prayers in Psalms. It's, it's, my mother spent, a, a, I remember a period of her life where she was seeking out the Psalms and praying all the prayers in the Psalms, and it helped her get through some hard times when she was being persecuted by evil bosses 
at her job. I remember that. So he, he opened his life up for examination. So David's life was a portrait of success and failure, like us, right? We have, we're filled with successes and failures, and so was David. The biblical record highlights the fact that he was far from perfect. But you know what made De David a cut above the rest? Was that his heart pointed toward God. He had a deep desire to follow God's will and do everything God wanted him to do. And that's what made him a man after God's own heart. We each all have a ministry. Our very lives are ministry. Like I tell you all, we are ambassadors of Christ. So in 1 Peter 2.9, in the Passion says, But you, and this is speaking to you, you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation. You are set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast. He did this so you can be ambassadors of Christ, that you can broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. You are living epistles. What's an epistle? A book of the Bible. The books that were written in the New Testament that are our life manual that teaches us how to live as Christians. Those are epistles. Well, you are living epistles. You might be the only Bible anybody ever reads. So you have ministry. Revelation 5.10 says, you have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. In, can you stand with me, please? Because we're ending now. And I want you to know that this very room is filled with a kingdom of priests. This, I'm looking at the kingdom of priests before me right now in Jesus' name. And you are gorgeous. <laughs> so in conclusion, whether you are called to be an elder or not, I want to prophetically declare this over you that you are a kingdom of priests unto the Lord God Almighty. Our past is behind us. We shall not live in condemnation. We are new creations. We are pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Though we may fall seven times, we shall rise again in Christ Jesus in his mercy. We love the Lord Yahweh, and we are men and women after his own heart because our hearts are pointed towards him, and we have a deep desire to follow God's will and do everything he wants us to do. So let us strive to be and do all that we've read today to the glory of God in Jesus' name. So let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this kingdom of priests that I stand before how glorious they are. They are blood-bought, blood-washed children of the Most High God. They are kids of the King. They are ambassadors of Christ. They are living epistles, and they are not going to walk in condemnation. Though they may fall, they shall rise up. I thank you so much, Father God, and I prophesy in the name of Jesus that each and every one of them and within the sound of my voice, shall fulfill the book that was written for each and every one of them, for their destiny before they were even conceived, according to Psalm 139.16. They shall fulfill every page in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this morning, and I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you need prayer, I'm here. I love you.